Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Christopher Downing. How, hi Christopher. Hi Joanna, good to be here. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Christopher is the author of Foolproof Dictation, which I actually have right here by my desk, and Foolproof Outline, as well as writing under pen names in new adult romance, science fiction romance, and military sci-fi. He's a full-time dad to three young children and also does online coaching for authors wanting to dictate, which is super useful. So Christopher, just give us a bit more about your background. How did you get into writing? Uh, well, I started in elementary school. Um, my, my biggest award that I've ever, I've ever won in writing was in fifth grade. Uh, I won a district ride writing competition. And, uh, and then it went downhill for about 20 years. Uh, I got back into it as an adult in 2005. And uh, I wrote a couple novels um, that I tried publishing traditionally that uh, didn't go very well, partly because I didn't know what I was doing yet. Uh, and then uh, I entered the, the indie world in about 2015 um, when I published my first memoir uh, on, under my real name, actually, at that time. Mm. So, uh, yeah. That was it. That was it. So I've been writing my whole life and it just, it took a long time to get there. Yeah. So, so why did you get, like, why did you want to be a writer? Because you, you mentioned you're a full-time dad. Is because being a writer is kind of flexible, isn't it? Um, it is. It is. I mean, there are still some demands uh, on, on being a writer, especially if we're indie now. It, it, it takes up, uh, if you're running your, your own business, um, you, you would know that. You've published a few books on that subject. Um, you know, whether you're doing your marketing or, um, or you know, what I found, uh, what I miss the most um, is just having creative quiet time. I'm a full-time dad, so I don't get a lot of daydream time. So that's probably the thing that, that eats into my ability to create the most as a full-time dad is is just quiet creative daydream time you don't get that a lot you know and when you do it's like 12 o'clock at night and I'm not much of a night person anymore so there you have it yeah well it's interesting we might come back to that later but let's um we're going to talk about dictation because I I've had a couple of authors on the show about dictation um and I've gone through my own dictation journey and when I found your book um which I think must have come out around the time when I was finding other things not working so well and I read it and I was like okay this is interesting this sounds more like me so can you give an overview of the writing session and then we'll get into the details of the different aspects sure um well let's see uh you know what I do is I I, I've systematically uh, divided my time up. Um, you know, the, the first half of my writing session is going to be um, warming up, uh, warming up my brain, revving up my brain. Mm. Um, you know, there's 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 the language composition parts of our brain um, that if you're an introvert or you spend a lot of time with children or you don't spend a lot of time talking to yourself all day, and which I think is most people, mm. um, when it comes time to, to dictate. Um, your, your brain's not ready to go. So what I do is I, I've systematically created a way to warm up your brain. Mm. Um, that's, that's, that's pretty important. So like, let's say you have a two hour window to do, get some writing in. Um, you know, you'll spend about 10 to 15 minutes um, reading out loud or doing some free writing, some sort of that activity, um, just loosey goosey kind of stuff. Um, and then um, I, you know, I've created some exercises. Um, so you spend about 40 minutes working through some exercises so, to, to focus specifically on some different kinds of, of of dictation that you might do, whether it's sentence construction or vocabulary work or something like that. Um, and then the second half, once your brain is ready to go, you know, then you dive into your work in progress. Mm. And I think the big issue that everyone has is you're just talking about spending 40 minutes warming up and like, isn't that a complete waste of time? <laughs> like, if right. people, because if people have only, let's say they have half an hour instead of two hours. So, and they spend seven and a half minutes of half an hour warming up when they could have written, I don't even know how many words in, in that long. So why your focus on that warming up and those exercises? Um, well, first off, uh, I think that you know, the bottom line is that experience is the best teacher. If if you have a half an hour to write, I promise you that the last 15 minutes of writing will go a lot more, will be much smoother and more pain-free if you spend the first half of it just free writing. 
um, and just and just writing anything. If you just dive into your work in progress, and I know 99% of authors out there have experienced this, if you sit down in front of your laptop and just start writing, um, it's hard to get going. It's almost a painful process. The next thing you know, you're searching your email and checking your sales page and that kind of stuff. You're finding the path of least resistance, and this this will come up again. Um, we're always going to the path of least resistance, um, and so it's just easier to get the the brain warmed up. So um, the other thing is, is you know, we've I think the indie world has gone through a phase uh, where we're all trying to write fast, um, whether we're doing 2K to 10K or 5,000 words per hour or or dabbling with dictation. Um, you know, there's just been this movement to to write quickly. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I did it, you know, and it's great. We all learned how to write quickly. Um, but at, this, at the same time, um, I think a lot of us got in the mindset that, achieving high words per hour, high words per day um, is the ultimate goal. Um, And I've kind of started stepping back from that a little bit and realizing too, and I I think a lot of other, and Chris Fox has mentioned this recently, um, it's time to start focusing on the craft um, a little bit more too. So if we can get high words per hour and yet at the same time warm up, uh, you know, the craft side of our brain um, where we, we can dictate let's say a decent sentence um, or, or a, a somewhat complicated sentence, a sentence that's uh, written beautifully or, or well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, I think that does us all, all better in the end. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think you're right. And um, well then let's circle back to why dictate then, because one of the reasons that many people want to dictate is to go faster. So what mm-hmm. are the reasons that you think people should consider dictation? Uh, okay, two reasons. One, it is faster, and and once once you get there, um, it is it is faster. Um, I like to use the analogy of if you were writing by hand most of your life, and someone handed you an electric typewriter, and they said, "Work with this for three months, and you know, let me know how it goes." And if you didn't have someone there training you, coaching you, encouraging you on a daily basis, you know, after two weeks, you would pick the thing up and throw it out the window and say, oh, "Why does this, why is Q the first letter? That doesn't make any sense." Uh, right. So, um, it's the same thing, you know, you got to stick with it. Um, it is faster if you stick with it. Um, and then the other thing, uh, that I think is the biggest bonus of dictation, um, is that you can enter a creative flow state, um, without the distractions. Um, um, I think your inner critic, once you get good at it, your inner critic goes away. Um, you're not worried about editing on the screen. Um, and uh, you don't have this computer in, in front of you. In fact, I, I dictate away from my computer now. Um, I, I, I'll go kind of – Monica Leonel talked about this, her walkie-talkies. Um, she'll pack her little bag and you know go for a walk and have people stare at her funny. I love that. Um, and uh, and I, I do that, except I, I don't go I don't go publicly. I, I still can't do that. Um, but you know, you get away from the computer, you get away from your distractions. Um, I think that's that's huge. Um, here's an example I, I like to give to people too. Um, there's a uh, there's a website called the Most Dangerous Writing App or the Most Dangerous App, um, and what it is is it's uh, an app where you it's typing, um, and you sit down and you set your writing sprint, three, five, 10, 20 minutes. Hmm. Uh, and then the cursor will pop up. And if you slow down your writing, um, if you stop writing for more than I think five seconds, the entire text disappears. So it forces you to keep going, right? Um, it's, it's horrible to you. you get 10 minutes into it and you get, and then you, everything just goes away and you're like, what? <laughs> there's, a sli- there's a slightly nicer version called write or die, which starts deleting backwards. Yeah, it starts deleting <laughs> backwards. So you don't lose everything. <laughs> <laughs> same, it's the same idea, right? Yeah, nerve yeah. Wracking, nerve wracking. Mm. Um, but uh, uh, where was I going with that? Oh, um, so I, I would encourage anyone to to try that because there's a com- no, there's a kamikaze version of it too, where it actually mm. blocks out what you write, um, so it prevents you from editing as you type, um, and that's great too. So if you try something like that, and you experience oh, there's there's no self editing as you type, and you realize that you can start typing faster, and then you can enter into that creative flow state mm-hmm. um, without editing as you type. And so, the point of that being, when you dictate, uh, the same thing happens. You can't edit as you type um, or as you as you write, and that forces you to, um, or it allows you to enter into that flow state. That's that's crucial for us as writers. It does make sense, and well, partly um, the reason why I really like your book is this um, cyclical 
writing idea which um, well first of all let's just be clear on that warm-up you are reading like you have some exercises but you also encourage people to read books in their genre to kind of get in the mindset don't you mm -hmm. yeah it's just it's just like before you have an interview with uh joanna pin you want to warm up your voice <laughs> so that you wake up you wake up at six in the morning and you want to warm up your voice before you start talking um yeah uh i would encourage anyone to to read out loud or do free writing um in fact i'm actually leaning no more towards free writing these days mm -hmm. just you know stream of consciousness writing um reading out loud is a great way too it just it just warms up your it warms up your mouth, uh, it warms up your breathing, um, it helps you integrate punction into your punctuation into your speaking, mm -hmm. um, and um, also too, when we when we when we write um, with a keyboard, um, we often use a different set of vocabulary, um, different sets of sentence construction than we do when we're talking to people um, or when we're dictating. So the idea is to try to merge those two. Um, so by reading out loud or practicing some free writing, um, it allows you to sort of delve deep and explore the vocabulary, the sentence constructions that you would use like you would do in writing. Otherwise, when you start dictating, you either have long rambling sentences, mm. uh, you overuse the word and. I, and, it just, and is the most frequently word used uh, in my dictation, at least when I was beginning. Um, or you write a lot of um, short choppy sentences and you know, none of which really work out so yeah I found that actually the short the short choppy sentences um, just because I didn't like saying comma a lot <laughs> sure. <laughs> which is funny but let's now talk about this um, the cyclical writing blocks the 2 5 10 20 uh, explain <laughs> that because I think this is the thing that really makes it a different approach yeah it, it um... The, it, it, this speaks to the inner critic and setting expectations. Um, and I'll, I'll tell the backstory of, of how that, this started. Um, this is where the full, foolproof dictation even began. Um, I was reading, um, was it coffee break? Oh, good. My mouth is getting dry. <laughs> also, you need to have a lucky, this is my owl cup. I've had this for eight years now. This is, you have to have a lucky coffee cup. <laughs> Usually when I take a coffee, it's because you're talking. <laughs> oh. When I'm talking, that's when you have a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> little pro trip, little pro tip for everyone listening. <laughs> Carry on. Don't, don't edit that out. That was great. <laughs> no, exactly. The backstory. So uh, I was reading uh, uh, Rachel Aaron's um, 2K to 10K, which most people have, have read at this point. It's been out for a couple of years. And um, she talked about um, with the, the one, one of the sides of her writing triangle is, uh, knowing what you're going to write. So she suggested writing a, a 200 to 500 word summary of your scene mm. before you started writing it. And, um, that was a great piece of advice, whether you're typing or dictating. Um, so I started doing that, um, uh, when I was, before I was dictating, um, and then that translated over to dictation. So I would, um, I would, dictate a small version of the scene, 250 words, um, and that would be about two minutes. Um, and then that was easy. I noticed that was easy. I could do that. Mm -hmm. um, and that helped clarify a lot of the ideas of the scene, the structure of the scene, where the scene was going. Um, and then I would say, well, let's try to expand that a little bit. Let's pick some of the beats, uh, the story, the, the, the scene beats, um, and try to expand them a little bit, add in some more detail. So then I would go for five minutes. Um, and then I would do it mostly from memory because the things that stuck out in my memory from what I did just the, the, the dictation before are usually the important the important parts. Mm. So I would do it for five minutes and then I would think about that for about 30 seconds and, and what really hit home and what I'd want to change. Um, and without slowing down too much, I would jump right into 10 minutes. Um, and then after that, I would do about a 20 minute, 20 minutes, a 20 minute dictation. Um, if you're not entirely flubbing it up is about, um, you know, a thousand, um, about 1800 words. You know, if you're, if you're dictating at about 5,000 words per hour, mm. um, don't do the math and test me on that. But, uh, you know, starting small, starting small, gradually increasing, increasing a little bit more. And the next thing you know, you're dictating the entire scene. Um, it's just, it just, it just feels a lot easier. Um, if you were just to say, even if you were typing, you know, write an 800 word scene, here's a small outline, go, you would probably spend, you know, three or four hours clunking your way through it. But if someone were to tell you, you know, write it, you know, 200 words and then, a th then 700 words, a thousand words, and then 2000 words, you could probably do it. Now, if you're typing, the idea of rewriting that much is, 
is uh, it's just uh, no, yeah. thank you. I don't I don't like rewriting when I'm typing. But if you think about it, if you write a scene using the two, five, ten, and twenty year, uh, minute cycles, you've you've only spent what forty. You can do the math on that one. You get mm. forty minutes. You know, and you've rewritten a scene what, four times. Um, working it through, developing it, expanding it, working in details. Um, and you've only spent 40 minutes rewriting a scene four times. And I, I think that's, that's worth the time. I mean, I think it's amazing what you can do with that. Yeah, and I think that's what's interesting. And I had Kevin J. Anderson on the show, and he talked about when you're starting out, just do notes to yourself and thoughts and ideas. Don't try to go from zero to finished draft writing with dictation, like with your first go. And that, like you say, expectations are, oh, I just pick up the, the device and I start talking and I magically create like a 2,000 word like chapter. <laughs> And yeah. that, that just doesn't happen, right? Whereas this is like, okay, two minutes, come up with a couple of sentences that will that are not your finished sentences. They're like just the outline. And as somebody who's not an outliner, <laughs> that to me just felt much more um, helpful in terms of getting to the point where I could then um, dictate the next draft. And just to be clear, what we're talking here with people is we're dictating into a device or or the computer, but you're not looking at the, the screen. So it's, um, and the point is then you could read that into the transcription mode and get it up on the screen if you wanted, but you said Correct. you don't do that anymore. No, no, I never did. Um, I think I dabbled with, you know, non-transcription, non writing directly onto the screen for about 10 minutes. And I said, mm. this is nuts. Um, although it was a previous version of Dragon, uh, I still, I still don't do it. It's transcription only. Um, I like to be away from the computer. Um, I, I carry notes with me. Um, in fact, I'll 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 email my a, a PDF of my own outline usually, or I'll print them out um, to my Kindle um, and keep them with me. But um, to be honest, at this point in my career, sitting in front of a computer is the least creative environment for me to do any writing. I can't stand it. I can't stand sitting in front of my computer when I'm writing. I would much rather be sitting in front of a three ring binder with my, my printed out outline and, and, and dictating. Mm. Honestly, I, I'm over my computer. I really, <laughs> I just, <laughs> it doesn't, it just, Every, yeah, whatever. Well, that's enough. That's another interview. I just, I'm over it. Well, no, I, 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 we will come back to that in a minute about <laughs> so marketing things. But um, it, the other thing I was thinking with the cyclical approach is that Dean Wesley Smith, who I'm a huge fan of, um, talks about writing into the dark, the dark as in, yeah. But he also talks about the his cyclical approach, which is he might write. Uh, 1500 words but then he'll kind of go back read through and maybe add a set he writes a clean first draft but he still cycles through that draft so each line is actually touched you know might be a couple of times and then he kind of works like that and, and your transcription method actually feels more like that which is by the second even if you don't do it four times if you maybe get it on the third time you you have been through a cycle so that that third time is much cleaner than if you just tried to do it once right mm -hmm. yeah for, for for if you're a pantser which you are which right i am yeah uh, yeah. Uh, good luck with that. I <laughs> well, I pretty much am. I, I know a few tent pole moments and then I pants it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, it's, you know, the, the scene will grow organically. Um, and whether you use an outline or a small outline or a detailed outline or you're entirely pantsing, um, the scene grows organically from the, from your own creativity. Um, and that's, that's, that's what makes it fun. Um, I, I, I liked uh, writing into the dark too. Um, I enjoyed that book too. I actually, went back and read that after I published foolproof outlines. So it's kind of like the, t the two extremes. Right. Um, but I, I, I get it and I love it. Um, you do need to be able to, um, you do need to be able to harness the excitement, um, from the creative centers of your brain while you're writing or you, otherwise your writing will come across as, as flat and dull and the reader will experience that too. And that's, uh, that's not good. Mm. Um, so, you know, letting scenes grow organically, um, even if you have a small outline or a detailed outline, um, I think is, part of the exciting process of writing. Yeah, and um, I, should, I should say, she reaches over and gets foolproof outline. Hello. 
<laughs> Hello. And um, I don't actually have every, you know, everyone who comes on the show, I don't have their books in print, but I actually bought yours in print because of the exercises that are in them. I actually find it easier to have them in print. So uh, they, and they're very short books, just so everybody knows they are not, what you're talking about is not some massive tome that takes forever to kind of understand. What you've done, I think, is break it down into a different way of of management, which which is great. So just um, before we talk about the outline, what are some of the excuses? The co- I mean, you do this coaching, this coaching for people who want to dictate, which I think is brilliant um, because there's so much, it's mindset, it's all mindset, really. Um, sure. So what are some of the common issues that people are bringing to you and how can we get past them? Uh, the, what's, what's the first one is punctuation, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, that's, it's so annoying. Um, but I think that's because people try to try to add punctuation, um, too soon. Um, I think you need to learn to be able to speak, uh, fluently, um, and develop sentence structure, um, be able to tap into your, your writing vocabulary before you do, um, punctuation. Punctuation should be the last thing that you fold in, um, so, uh, what is it? It's, I think editing, editing is going to be a, a huge one. Um, there's accuracy, there's editing. Um, so I'll, I'll speak to a few of them briefly. Um, ac- accuracy, if you're speaking, if, unless you're from East Texas, um, if you're, sp- if you're speaking accurately and slowly, um, with controlled breathing, um, the new versions of dictation of dragon are going to give you a, a good accuracy no matter what. Um, I think you're going to get close to 95 to, to 99% accuracy. Um, so the key is to learn how to speak slowly with good breathing and speak articulately. Um, and if you can do that, that really will take care of most of, of your accuracy problems. Um, and Scott Baker, Scott Baker mentions that a lot in his books, mm. his book too. Um, the editing, um, you know, that, that website I talked about, the the world's most dangerous app or, or right to die that you mentioned. Um, so do that, you know, like uh, sit down in, in, the, in the kamikaze mode and where it covers up what you write um, and then start, you know, type a small scene or, or type the story of Little Red Riding Hood out and see how much faster you type um, if you can't see what you need to go back and edit. Mm-hmm. That, that said, you'll see how many mistakes that you make. You make a ton of mistakes if you're not watching what you type on the screen. Um, so what you're doing is you're actually eliminating a huge amount of time um, that when you go back and correct words as you type or – and I know we're not supposed to do it, but we all do it. Mm-hmm. If you see a sentence that doesn't look right or the punctuation's wrong or you've misspelled a couple words or autofill has taken over your world and destroyed it, um, you, you're, always, you're always going back and, and correcting as you go. Um, so if you were to tell me that I spend too much time after I've transcribed – editing all the mistakes or editing things out, well, I would would counter that by saying, how much editing do you do as you type? Um, And that editing as you do as you type interferes with the creative creative flow state that you're trying to achieve as a writer. Mm. Um, So I think think, uh, the net gain of of dictation actually creates creates less editing in the long run once you get the accuracy in in your articulation down, Mm. that out of, yeah. Is that the path of least resistance um, you know, as, as human beings, I don't, I don't care what hobby you're taking up or, or what you do for a living, your brain will often go to the path of least resistance. Um, and if you're, if you're good at typing at the keyboard, if you're great at typing at the keyboard, that's only going to make the switch to dictation more difficult. Um, because as you struggle with dictation, you're going to want to just, just type it out. You know, it'll go so much faster. Um, and that's where the, that's where the coaching comes in. Um, and I do believe I'm, I'm the only coach out there offering the service. Mm-hmm. It's just someone that can ch- check in with you on a daily basis and give you encouragement. Um, when I was starting to dictate, um, I wish I had, you know, whether it was a, a Facebook group or uh, a writing group locally in town where we could get together and give each other daily encouragement um, or hold each other accountable to uh, to dictating without falling back to the path of least resistance, which is, which is yeah. typing. Yeah. No, that's great because I think uh, a lot of people have these, and I keep coming back to it. It's so funny. I've been interviewing people on dictation. Monica was like four years ago or something, you know, and I've I've done two bu- two novels and some of nonfiction. Oh, we should just say all of this stuff is this is is this the same for nonfiction? Because of course you have nonfiction books as well. Yeah. Uh, yes. Absolutely. Um, 
yeah, I mean, you, you still have to organize your brain before before you get started, and you have to l- learn how to organize your brain on the fly. It's the same thing, whether you're nonfiction or, or fiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's important. Um, so let's talk about the out the foolproof outline briefly, because it is something because you've kind of broken down the dictation. I think you've also done the same with outline, and you use Scrivener for the outline and you actually have some templates which are fantastic now i use scrivener but what one thing people get really confused about is how do you use scrivener with dictation and outlining so can you just explain how those things fit together in a process so that people can kind of visualize it and then of course they can get the books if they want more detail well the thing with scrivener is it's What's great about Scrivener is that is that you can use it however you want to. There's no right or wrong way to use Scrivener. Um, for me, it's an organizational tool. I, I can only speak how I do it. Um, it's an organizational tool. I use it for my outlining, um, and I, I organize my scenes. I have um, questionnaires, um, you know, over off on the side that I use for my brainstorming. Um, in the end, um, I don't write directly to Scrivener. I don't anymore now that I'm, I'm dictating well. Um, I'll, I'll, I will dictate into my I – I do have this, by the way. Uh, I just want to show up. This is my little buddy right here. This is my little, my little recorder. I used to use a, a voice app on my phone, but this is the way to go. Um, so Wait, I'll take t- this. Tell us what yeah. it is, because everyone's like now know what, what's to know what it is. Oh well, I, I'll, I'll send you a link if, if that's all right too. It's a Sony um, model. Sure, that's a big number. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a Sony, and uh, I uh, I use, use this little splitter here. Um, I also use this is my Logitech headset that I bought four years ago for fifteen dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, it does have a noise cancel- cancellation boom. Um, I think I've seen your setup. It's you have a very nice setup, right? You have a pretty fantastic mic, don't you? Well, I, I, for podcasting, but but for the um, for dictation, I just have a little Sony. But we'll put the link to your setup in the show notes. Um, but yeah, sure. carry on with, so, with how Scrivener yeah. works. Hmm. So yeah, so Scrivener. So uh, I use it for organizing. Um, I'll use it for. Um, uh, organizing my work, organizing my, my questionnaires and, and outlines. Um, what I do now is I will um, often print my, print my outline out, print my questionnaires out, um, put them in a three reminder, um, leave the computer aw- away uh, behind. Um, if I need to, I'll get a hotel room for 99 bucks a night and, uh, or something like that, or, or go to the library, find a study room. Um, and without the computer there, I'll just use my paper notes um, and my dictation. And then when I, I transcribe, um, through Dragon, um, and that will usually pump it into. I use a rich text document. I don't use Word. Um, Word tends to get there's just a couple variables with Word that I don't like to use with transcription. So I'll just use a rich text document, and then just simply cut and paste it over into Scrivener. So uh, I don't write into Scrivener. I just use it for organization. Yeah, exactly. And um, I do as well. I think this is really important. Do not try and dictate with Dragon into Scrivener or Word because it, things just go really wrong, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> they do. They do. Um, especially if, if you're dictating live without using transcription. I mean, how many times have you looked up and an entire paragraph is just gone? And you're like, what? Or it's stuck like, on it- something like, a, you know, it's stuck doing like repeating a word or. Yeah. So that's just a real tip. Like, keep it simple, dictate and then sure. you put the file in. I do the same thing. But just to wind it back on the outline, do you type your outline into Scrivener? Or do you do your outlining on, with dictation and then do, it, do put the outline in that way as well? Pen and paper. Um, I will actually print out, um, I will print out my outline and my questionnaires um, that I talk about in, in the foolproof outline. Mm-hmm. I print them out now, um, put them in a three ring binder and um, I'll sit on the couch and just use a pen and paper. And I just like doing that. It just, it takes me to a creative space and uh, maybe that was comfortable for me 20 years ago. Um, but like I said, sitting on the computer just doesn't feel creative to me anymore. So I don't like doing that. So I use pen and paper to, to outline and brainstorm. Okay, cool. So you, you write stuff down, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you write stuff down by hand and then you type into Scrivener the things that you wrote down and -hmm. then you print out what you've typed and then you take that and you dictate from that kind of outline. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So it's a bit of everything really, but the point is the 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 long actual finished text is dictated and then you edit. Presumably, do you hand edit on a printed final draft or something? I mean, you know, manuscript? Uh no, I'll, I'll edit. I'll edit in Scrivener. 
I, I will. I'll, I'll use the keyboard when I when I edit um, because my fingers are so fast um, when it comes to editing. Um, you know, selecting and cutting and cutting, cutting and pasting and moving text around and um, right clicking to get, open up the thesaurus, that kind of thing. It just it works so much faster on the keyboard. Um, you know, one point I do want to make to everybody is um, we are talking about a first draft. Mm. Uh, when when I dict I, I would never dictate anything beyond a, a first draft. Um, it I'm not that good yet. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure anyone is that good yet. Um, I think that's I, th I think um, you know eliminating the expectations of of a um, of of a quality draft when you're dictating um, makes things easier. Um, so we're talking about a first draft, and and sometimes um, if if I'm dictating and I catch myself using small clunky sentences or run on sentences, it, it's going to happen. Um, but you just roll with it, um, and you you got to trust your editing process. Um, you know, I'll, I'll edit. I mean, like most of us, I'll probably edit. Well, unless you're um, uh, Wesley, uh, then you, you don't edit much in the end. But I mean, I'll edit something, you know, three or four times, three or four passes before I, I think it's close to finished. Um, so mm -hmm. we are talking about dictating a first draft. Yeah, I think that's really important too. Um, okay, so let's come on to the privacy thing um, because you manage all these different pen names. Now I say manage pen names because uh, you know I manage three different pen names. I have websites, I have email lists, I have social media. I do all these different things for all my pen names. Now um, explain how you do pen names and how you also do the privacy thing and the no social media thing and, and how do you, why and how do you do all of that? Um, two things. Well, it's, it's half, half of it's necessity. Uh, I'm a full-time dad. I don't, I don't have time for, for social media. I, I detest social media anyways, but even if I didn't, um, I just, I don't have, I don't have time for that. It's just like, I don't have time for, um, much marketing. I think I've found, um, you know, so much more, what, what the return on marketing, um, isn't that great. So you spend 90% of your time and you get like a 10% return or whatever, something like that. Um, so I found, um, you know, just focus on what little time you have. If you just focus on writing good books, um, a bunch of them, um, you know, I think that that's, that's where the payoff is. I just don't have time for marketing. I don't have time for Facebook. I don't have, I don't have time to allow my brain to get sucked into, you know, checking notifications so often. So, um, I do have I do have what four four pin names. Who knows next month it'll be five. Um, uh, that that just came from well the first the first time was I was writing romance and um, there is a rumor out there that male romance writers don't do as well as female romance writers um, and it's true and it's true. Okay. Uh, so uh, I did I did I, I chose a female uh, pin name for for romance. Um, but then there was, I was in Facebook at that time and then I was caught in this dilemma of, well, do I create this fake persona or do I just have a pin name and just let it go? Because creating a fake persona where I'm interacting with readers, which I caught myself doing, seems like fraud. That didn't mm -hmm. feel right at all because they thought they were talking to a woman and I was pretending to be a woman and I was like, ah, this is not right. This isn't good. <laughs> so I, sh I shut that all down. I was like, eject, eject. Uh, so I shut that down. Um, so I use pen names, but I, I don't use them to create a social media presence. I don't, I don't create a false persona. It's just a pen name. It all, it's all there is to it. Um, I actually do uh, have a, a male pen name that I do for uh, new adult romance um, mm -hmm. too, um, and there's um, there's an, an, a small enthusiastic readership um, that doesn't feel comfortable either. So I need to create a barrier um, there. Um, and I also have three kids, and I have a you know I'm happily married with three kids, and we just we're not afraid of the outside world. It's just, it's just nice when you have this little protected environment. Um, I use a, a fake address for my mailing lists, that kind of thing. I, uh, I just don't want anyone, you know, it's like when you receive a one-star review, you know, it's like, they don't just tell you how bad your book is. They tell you how bad of a person you are, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I just don't want that in my life. So I've chosen, um, to, to not do that. So that's, that's why I use not only pen names, but I just, I just don't want that in my life. And again, I know everyone's going, oh, well, how does he sell any books? And because we're keeping your pen name secret, we can't like point to your books. But um, sure. can you give us a, a number of how many books you have out there? Because I think you said, you know, you have to have more than like three books, right, to to market by writing. 
Yeah. Uh, no, I have uh, 10, 10, uh, 10 full length books. Um, and then I dabble a lot in short romance stories too, mm-hmm. um, which is, which is just sort of a, a fun hobby I have. It's, I almost feel like it's a little bit different than my writing career. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, you, uh, there's, there's different ways that you can market outside of social media. I mean, I still use paid advertising through um, Amazon, um, which once you start getting keywords down, it, it, there's, it, it does pay off. Um, you know, I do rely heavily on the almost bo- or the, uh, the almost bots, the also bots. <laughs> <laughs> almost not that one. Uh, that would be uh, a yeah. different list. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. Um, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I did dabble, uh, with the money suck, uh, Facebook advertising there for a little bit and I lost a ton of money over a six month period. And I just, I, uh, I just found other ways to do it. So, um, you know, I still say the best way to market a book is to put the, you know, series, I always write in series, um, is to put the, at the very end, um, put the sales link to the next book in the series at the, on, on the last page in the back matter of your book. And if they like the first book, they're going to buy the second book. And you can't convince somebody just through marketing and buzzwords um, to buy a book. If they like your book, they're going to buy it. If they don't buy it, well, then you should probably start rethinking on how you wrote, wrote the book in the first place. Um, so that's the biggest payoff. Um, you know, the temptation there, of course, is to do a, a pre-order, which I've done in the past and made that mistake, is to put a pre-order in the back matter of a book. I would encourage everyone to never, ever, ever do that <laughs> because that creates a sense of pressure that you don't want in your life. Um, mm-hmm. But that, that's how I do it. That's it. That's 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 my secret. I put the, the sales page on the back matter of a book um, for the next book in the series, um, and then let it roll, and then just use some uh, some advertising to try to get in people's also bots. Right. Okay. That's it's interesting because I know quite a few authors who do this approach, and it mm-hmm. definitely uh, it definitely suits. Um, you know, people who are focusing on the writing first and also with pen names, I totally agree with you. It's very difficult to do all the different types of marketing like I do under my own name. I, I can do lots of things because it's it's me and I don't have to, to hide that. But romance, I, I agree with you, can be particularly difficult. So, um, yeah, I, I get that. It's a good a good recommendation. And did you so you said you were on Facebook and then you wound it back. Um, did you ever do any of the other social media? Oh, I did. I did Twitter um, for a little bit. Um, and, and you know Twitter did great. I, I met some great connections. Um, while I was doing I was doing work on male depression um, and advocacy advocacy, advocacy uh, work um, for men with mental illness at that time. So that I, I built a lot of really great connections when I wrote my first memoir, mm-hmm. um, and that that's under my regular name. People can find that. Um, uh, this, the, the the great psychologist uh, Stephen Hanley, who wrote the forward, I met him through Twitter. So um, I'm, not, I'm not a total luddite, you know. I think there's there's some benefits, but I think the net gain. Um, there's not really a net gain when it comes to social media. That's just my personal opinion. So it was on, honestly, it, it it was the 2016 American presidential election that just caused me to just to bail. I couldn't. I was like, it was. It just really showed me like how how negative this place can be. So that that was a, that was when I bailed. Completely. Yeah, it's really interesting, and I think there's a lot of people who are tired of social, whatever political side of the spectrum they are on, it, it has become very um, argumentative and opinionated and, and things. So I my kind of method is to just mute and block and, you know, mark as spam and just loads of methods for cutting out the noise. Um, sure. uh, so I think if, if people, people listening um, are attracted to what you've done, but feel like they're way deep, like I am. <laughs> yeah, like there are <laughs> there are ways that you can control that noise without giving it up completely. Um, and one really good thing is the digital fast. Obviously, when you can when you just give it up for like a week, and then you might calm down. But I love what you've done. I think it's it's really interesting. Okay, so we're out of time. Tell people where they can find um, you and your books, and that we can talk about and your dictation coaching online. Sure. Um, right now, I'm uh, coach.me. Um, I, I provide uh, it's affordable coaching for people who want to learn dictation. It's 15 bucks a month. Um, we dabble into all sorts of writing. Um, the best thing is uh, about it is just someone who's going to hold you accountable to using your dictation and not falling back on the, on the keyboard too much. Um, I offer uh, different packages for 
uh, beginning writers and professional writers. So anyone who's who's published plenty of books but have trouble with dictation, um, I have I have some ideas for them too. Um, you know, the only place you can really find me is is on my Amazon uh, Amazon homepage. So it's uh, Christopher Downing. Well, I don't know. I don't know whatever that is, but you just you can, you can search for me there on Amazon, and uh, that's that's where I am. Brilliant. Otherwise, Otherwise, I'm hiding in a cave in, in Colorado. <laughs> oh, Colorado. Now we know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, that's fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Christopher. That was great. Thank you so much, Joanna.